I think it's a rule of entertainment, you're never supposed to follow children, dogs, or really good musicians. <laughs> and so, but it's a real pleasure for me to be talking to a bunch of people who want to be here, as opposed to what I normally do. Uh, <laughs> so, I will be talking today about, um, about, well, about a part of a city. Cities are the greatest human artifact, the greatest thing we've ever made is the city. Human beings have conceived cities, we've made them, we've remade them, we've degraded them, unfortunately, but they are, uh, they're fundamental to who we are as human beings. Aristotle, who talked a lot about cities, in fact, uh, in speculating about the history of cities, Aristotle said, as people came together originally in cities just to survive, to live, but they stayed in cities to live the good life. And he was convinced that the good life, the best human life that could possibly be lived was a life that was lived in the city. Now, cities are immensely complex. Jane Jacobs says cities are problems of organized complexity. Uh, but they're not so complex that you can't understand them. In fact, physically, you can break a city down into just three parts, which is pretty nice. There's, there are the buildings, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, there are the spaces, public and private spaces, which I'm not going to talk about. And then there are the streets, the places of passage in cities, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So, streets. Paved streets, as far as we know, are about 4,500 years old. For about 4,400 of those years, paved streets were the domain of virtually everybody. They were public places, they were places where you could go, where you could, of course, move from one part of the city to another, but they were also places of human interaction. They were places of commerce, they were places of entertainment, they were buskers on the street, cities uh, in, in cities are, are go to the streets, and so these were the places that people could go and could do all of these kinds of things. They, they were places people looked forward to. And then, about a hundred years ago, everything changed. What was that? Well, we all know what caused the change, and most of us, in fact, don't regret it very much. Uh, in 1908, the first Model T was sold. And that changed everything. And nothing changed more quickly, more dramatically after that than the streets. Streets which had been places for public passage, places of, regardless of your social status, your class, you could go out on the streets. You had the right to be on the streets. I don't want to romanticize it too much, but compared to the sorts of streets we've created for ourselves now, these were old streets, were remarkably free and easy places. So, until the car came along. Very quickly, motorists began to commandeer streets, showing all the subtlety and sophistication of schoolyard bullies. I'm bigger than you. I'm faster than you. So get out of my way and give me your lunch money. This was pretty much the way things worked. And so streets which had been for everybody very rapidly became places which were restricted solely to motorists, to automobiles. So, this was so bad that in 1954, General Motors put out an automobile propaganda film called Give Yourself the Green Light. And in this, the, the narrator intoned, we have fought the war for our right of way and we have won. Okay, the war was fought, of course, to rid the streets of everyone but auto, auto drivers and automobiles. We invented a new crime. We gave it a new name, jaywalking, which meant, in fact, getting in the way of cars. That's the crime of jaywalking. This was something that, that was, it was remarkable how quickly this, this changed everything. Streets which had, been, uh, which had been places of passage for everybody, as I said, became places of passage for automobiles only. And the job of the, of the street now in the, in the modern city was to allow the unimpeded, rapid, smooth passage of automobiles from one place to another. The people whose job it was to figure out how to do this began to call themselves traffic engineers. And they were, in the world of city planners, they were the big wheels. If anyone came up with a plan, a project for making a city better or changing it, if a traffic engineer said, you know, it's going to slow traffic down. That plan was dead. 
There's no question about it. So these were like urban gods. They had the capacity to bestow life or to withhold it. It was a brutal sort of a thing. And they were very successful at that. And so they turned our streets into places that were successful for automobiles, but not for anything else. The only problem was, instead of getting better, traffic got worse, and it got worse. Traffic engineers came up with all sorts of devices to make it better. Uh, stop signs, traffic lights, one-way streets. We eviscerated our cities and, and plowed what are technically called high-speed limited access highways through them, which very quickly became low-speed limited access highways. But they've already done damage to the city. These were things that were, that were attempts to make the city more useful for the automobile, this great human, the greatest human artifact, the thing that we concerned ourselves with for the life, the good life, had become uh, transformed to accommodate an, a machine. We have this, um, this situation now where the, the transformation of the city was pretty much intact, pretty much complete, and we wanted to, uh, we wanted to go forward with these ideas about the city as a place primarily for automobiles, less for other people. It was a, it was a war, as I have said, and the war, um, the war was won by the automobile. So it's time, I would say, for us to start rethinking this whole idea. It might be time to reopen the war, which General Motors so smugly but so rightly concluded in 1954 was a war that had been won by the automobile. The victory was bloody, there's no question about it. But, um, but it was even bloodier after that. When we start to think of the cost of automobiles in, in our towns and cities, we tend not to think about that because this is actually a cost that we don't like to, to consider we have to pay, but it's a cost that so many of us do pay in various kinds of ways. We don't think about it because we've considered it to be, we've assumed, we've concluded it's a cost of doing business or rather a cost of going places. Traffic engineers have done cost-benefit analyses and have concluded that it's the best we can do, live with it. I'm not sure that's something that we need to do. In fact, so if we reopen the war and talking about using the language of war, if we talk about the things that have to get done, it might be uh, a little shocking, but it's not hyperbolic because if you imagine what a negotiated peace with, with motorists is going to be, it is in fact going to be this. I don't know how many of you have seen these. These flags are orange, sometimes they're yellow. They're really all just white, surrender flags. There is not an opportunity we have in fact with uh, with motorists to come up with a negotiated settlement. Now, I don't want to beat up on engineers. Engineers are very smart. There's much smarter people than I am. Uh, and traffic engineers, in fact, have done precisely what we want them to do. They have given us what Jim Kunstler calls auto sewers. But those are the things that we want to have. So we thought we wanted to have. And so, um, so there's no, there's no criticism of traffic engineers for, for doing what they've done. There is, however, I, I would say, criticism that can be made, which is that traffic engineers are guilty of a uh, category confusion. That is, traffic engineers use a branch of physics called fluid dynamics to actually model and, uh, and predict traffic flows and things like this. Fluid dynamics is the study of liquids in motion. Uh, and so it's proved to be actually pretty useful to traffic engineers. It's a great metaphor, but if you stop thinking, or if you forget that you're using something as a metaphor, and you start to think of it as a reality, to use this millennial word, if you start to think of it literally, then you get into trouble. It's called hubris, and that's even older than cities, I would say. So, we have, uh, we've come to this situation where traffic engineers are not making a distinction between human beings and water molecules. Okay, 
So, what is it that we can do? What is it the, the sorts of things that we can do? Well, I would say that we need to start looking again at the cities that we have, we need to, or at the streets that we have. We need to find streets, everyone needs to find a street that makes your heart sing. The kind of street that, in fact, makes you catch your breath when you come, when you come upon it. They don't have to be big, they don't have to be little, but those are the sorts of streets that we, in fact, need to look for. You need to walk on these streets, because streets are made to be walked on at three miles an hour. That's the speed of human beings moving. Don't even waste your time with 40 mile an hour streets. Those are the streets traffic engineers love. They're uniformly awful as human habitats, and don't waste your time on them. Find where people congregate and see what's going on. Most of the time, the streets people congregate on are streets that traffic engineers don't like. They're inefficient. That is, they impede the uninterrupted flow of traffic. They frequently are cluttered up with fixed hazardous objects. We call them trees, but traffic engineers call them <laughs> fixed ha hazardous objects. They're also, by the way, cluttered up frequently with moving hazardous objects. <laughs> As moving hazardous objects, we need to remind ourselves that the primary purpose of a city is, in fact, us. We're the things that make it worthwhile. So I'm going to end with some good news. The good news is that there's a difference between water molecules and people. That's nice to know. On December 15, 1973, a portion of the West Side Highway in Lower Manhattan collapsed under the weight of a loaded dump truck. Ironically, it was loaded with asphalt going to repair roads. 80,000 80,000 cars a day travel on the West Side Highway in 1973. That's a huge number of cars. Traffic engineers were in a panic. They predicted total gridlock in the entire southern part of Manhattan. So what happened? Nothing. 80,000 cars a day disappeared. They still don't know where they went 40 years later. In, in 2009, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, who was the traffic commissioner in New York under, under Mayor Bloomberg, began to close sections of Broadway in midtown Manhattan from 42nd to 47th streets. This is Times Square. Closed traffic, closer to traffic, made it a pedestrian uh, enclave. This was finished in 2013. Disaster was predicted. New Yorkers loved it. Traffic moves in midtown Manhattan better than it ever did before. Last year, Mayor de Blasio, a self-proclaimed progressive and a self-proclaimed car guy, made noises about reopening Times Square to, to automobile traffic. The reaction from New Yorkers was immediate and, of course, abrupt and pretty blunt. Uh, <laughs> from the New York Times to the New York Post, this is not a left-right political issue. So de Blasio backed away from this and left it the way, the way it was. Because what people are finding is that even though we've forgotten what places are like, what streets are like, how great they can be. When we see them, even for a little bit, we say, you know, we, we want these to be part of what we are. This is, this is a, a theatrical, well, this is a theater. It happens to be a Renaissance theater that shows the city as, as a theatrical place, the city as, a, as the place of tragedy, of comedy, of the life we live, we live every day. The streets are where this is lived out. So we can have the streets that we've got, or we can, in fact, look back, look at streets that are, that are beautiful, that are, make our life more exciting, more worthwhile, and we can want those things back again. It's up to us. Thank you very much.